We are uh, a mere couple of minutes away from a news conference with Minneapolis Mayor Arte Ryback. And imagine the situation uh, that the people are in on the bridge and everybody who's trying to help out the rescue. And at the same time, the civic leaders in and around Minnesota and the city of Minneapolis. The focal point for Minneapolis was supposed to be next summer with right. the 2008 Republican convention. And the world was supposed to turn its eyes here on on this uh, convention, and now uh, they're dealing with this situation that everybody around the world is hearing about. Jeff Ballion has been on the scene all night. Jeff, what can more. you tell us? I'm on a 19th Street bridge, which is just parallel to the 35W bridge, which collapsed. Now, you got an idea how high this bridge is? I want you to take a look here. That's how far we're talking that collapse was, a good 60 feet or more. And down there, you can see the uh, fire and rescue teams looking for any sign of survivors, crushed vehicles everywhere. Uh, we've been talking to emergency crew members who have arrived here from all over the metro area. I talked to the fire chief from Roseville who said they had an alarm went off at their station. It was a multi-alarm, something they've never heard before, and they were ordering all rescue equipment from Ramsey County over here to help. Over here we have a uh, U.S. Army helicopter. Maybe we can talk to these gentlemen uh, uh, first of all, what's your name, sir? Uh, Sergeant Rudy Gomez. Rudy, uh, tell us what your what your mission is going to be here. Uh, so far, we don't have any news yet. They're uh, they're talking to the state representative of what's going on. Where uh, if they're, we're needed, we'll be doing search and rescue, uh, hoist missions, pulling people out of the water if need to be. Okay, what are you capable of doing with this helicopter? Uh, medevac, uh, hoist hoist missions, and uh, we we can do sandbags or anything that's needed out of us. All right, thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Uh, let's look down the bridge here. You can see just a portion of the uh, medical or the emergency crews that are here standing by, waiting for word on what's going to happen next. Uh, it appears to be uh, mainly a, a, a recovery mission at this point. We don't see any indication of any rescues occurring. We'll let you know as more information uh, comes along. For now, Jeff Dyan reporting in Minneapolis. Officials have confirmed it is a recovery effort, and we want to tell you that Fox 9 News at 9 starts right now. Now, on Fox 9 News, bridge collapse. This is sheer chaos. Moments of sheer terror. I can hear the pounding as it collapsed, but I just, you know, I basically put my foot on the brakes and held on to the steering wheel. Dozens of cars plummet into the Mississippi. We felt it go pow, pow. It must have gone at least three to four, I think four times. People trapped, rescued, and the search for victims begins. Hi, everyone. We thank you for joining us for this extended coverage on Fox 9 News. We're starting our 9 o'clock with total devastation that happens at the height of rush hour. That's right. Dozens of cars, hundreds of people plummeting into and toward the Mississippi River. Some of the cars and trucks catching fire. And uh, as it was described before, just absolute horror. Hospitals around the metro filling up. We have reports of at least one person drowned, six people injured in critical condition, and about 20 others are in non-critical condition. That's just at HCMC. In fact, they've called the code orange. All hands on deck and all Minneapolis firefighters have been asked to report to their different fire stations as well. And police officers have been asked to report to their precincts not to help out at the scene anymore because it has become a recovery uh, mission now, but asked to report to their precincts to help out with whatever other duties they could do. 20,000 people are at the Metrodome. They are staging, trying to get people back, rerouted out of their homes. We've had various coverage sped all across the scene. Our reporters were there talking to victims, talking to rescuers. Let's first go to Fox 9's Jamie Reese. Jamie, early on, was there. She had a lot of information. She was able to see victims that were being pulled out of cars, pulled out of concrete rubble, uh, laying on the sidewalk, being helped, comforted by people on the scene. We heard from Tom Lydon. Tom Lydon talked with several people who ran down to the scene, were able to assist. A woman who happened to be looking out of her window, watching for her husband who took that bridge home every night, watched it as it collapsed in front of her eyes. Joggers who were out for their nightly jog happened to see plumes of white smoke billowing into the air, and many of them described it was like an earthquake. And then the difficult situation, because this is a major thoroughfare as it crosses from central and downtown Minneapolis into uh, the University Avenue and up towards northeast Minneapolis, how do you get the rescue personnel there when this major bridge across the river is no longer there? And Jeff Goldberg's been at HCMC all night long. Let's go to him for the very latest there. Jeff? 
Okay, Jeff, sorry I lost hearing for there for a moment, but we are at HCMC sort of awaiting possibly another update. What we can tell you right now is that the hospital has confirmed one drowning death. That, uh, that update came about 15, probably about 30 minutes ago. They can also confirm six critical injuries and 22 serious injuries. Once again, one confirmed drowning death, six critical injuries, 22 serious injuries. We do not know the details of some of those injuries in terms of the critical. They said that a lot of them to extremities, to head and different uh, parts of the face and different parts of the body. Certainly a, a difficult time here at HCMC, but they do feel that hospital workers responded very well. They had a lot of workers that came in on their day off when they saw what was going on. They felt like the response was exactly how they wanted it to be. They do not know at this point what to expect for the rest of the night. They say, or they did say about 30 minutes ago, they were sort of rapidly approaching that moment in the night when they would not expect that many more people to come in from this tragedy. Probably in the last 30 minutes, We've seen a few ambulances trickling in, bringing people from the scene. Again, we do not have any more numbers than they gave us on that last update. What we can tell you, though, is that, again, this is a somewhat calm situation, all things considered, at HCMC. They feel very strongly about how they've handled this. We've seen some family members of victims come by here, and they've certainly been obviously shocked and saddened and stunned and all the adjectives you can think of about what has taken place here, not really knowing what happened to their loved one. We spoke with a woman not too long ago who was going to meet her her sister her brother-in-law and their two children to send them off to college she said that they got in the accident she said that she knew that the two children had gone to the had gone to the hospital and that the brother-in-law had gone to the hospital but she did not know what the situation was with her sister so obviously that's just one one story of how confusing and how troubling and how just shocking this is for everyone around the twin Cities. so we hope to get an update for you in not too long we will have that for you as soon as it becomes available reporting live from hcmc jeff goldberg fox 9 news can you talk about the humanitarian aspect you uh, well jeff talked about a number of people who jumped in their pickup trucks right, we've been to told. give firefighters right. a hand to bring them into hcmc driving them right into the back of some good Samaritans pick up two firefighters and one of the victims who was on the scene right. and HCMC, Hennepin County Medical Center, just one of many hospitals that is very busy tonight. There are several right in and around downtown Minneapolis when you think of all of the hospitals that are not that far away. And we have uh, more reporters on the scene. Jeff uh, Goldberg was right there as you saw at HCMC, but Maury Glover not far from where all this took place. Maury, update us. That's right. Well, we're just to the south of the area where the bridge collapsed. And as you can see, the area over at Seven Corners is still a parking lot, just as it has been for the last three hours, as uh, both emergency crews and people who are just curious and want to check out what happened have been coming down to the area. You know, we've been advising people all evening long, if you don't have any business in this area, to stay away, because all you're going to do is get in the way of emergency workers. We did speak with a couple of people who were on the bridge when the bridge collapsed. Obviously, they said they saw the bridge buckle and then just give way. They went down maybe 40, 50 feet. Uh, the people I spoke with weren't hurt, but there were a lot of people who are. So again, uh, we've seen uh, emergency rescue boats coming from uh, fire departments all over the metro, as far away as Anoka County, all trying to get down here and do what they can. But if you do not have any business down here, please stay away because all you're going to do is get in the way of emergency workers down here. Uh, that's all for right now, guys, but uh, if we have anything else, we'll let you know. Okay, Maury, Maury stay Glover. on scene. He's on the south end of the bridge. We also have crews on the north end of the bridge. That's where we find Beth McDonough, who's been standing by. Beth, give us an update. <laughs> Yeah, Jeff and Robin here on the north end of the bridge. This is where they brought the survivors. Once they were plucked out of their cars, taken off the bridge, they brought the survivors and they put them right over there in that parking lot area. And I can tell you, the looks on their faces really said it all. There were people who were crying, people running to their loved ones, hugging each other, fellow survivors even hugging each other. Our vantage point here is both revealing and it's rattling. Let's take a look at some of the videos so you can also see for yourself what we have been seeing for the past couple of hours. That is our vantage point right there. You can see a section of the bridge that has collapsed. It's one of three sections here on the north end. Now that red car that is packed under another car there, we spoke with that survivor. Her name is Melissa Hughes and she says that uh, she didn't even realize that the bridge was buckling underneath her until she felt it start to rumble. That was her first inkling that something serious was going on. And you can see that a belching black smoke was going up from that bridge area. Cars just smashed into each other like a demolition derby. At that time, keep in mind, it was rush hour, so it was bumper to bumper on that bridge. Once the drivers realized something was going on, they couldn't get out of the way. There was absolutely nowhere to go. 
This area also was the initial staging area uh, because you can see the fourth section of the bridge there was still intact. So rescue crews came here to kind of set up their command post, but worried that that fourth section of the bridge might also collapse. They didn't take any precautions. They backed out of the area. Uh, they relocated somewhere else. They also told everyone else in the area, get out of the way because it's not clear exactly what might happen. Now, as you know, for some people here, it's not that they didn't have help. They didn't have a chance. But at one point, we were talking to some other drivers who were hanging on for dear life. And take a moment to understand what at least one survivor went through. Um, I was the red car, so I'm very lucky. Um, I don't really know all of a sudden. It was kind of this free fall feeling and seeing things in the air and just, just yeah. <laughs> Did you see the bridge collapsing before your eyes? Um, just more so things in the air that shouldn't be in the air. Like what? Just cars and things, people in the air. That like shouldn't someone be just the, tossed something up, up in the, the air? air? Yeah. The cars landed on top of yours. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, with, with your baby? No, no. My husband brought my baby so I could feed her. Oh, okay. So you have to get that part. <laughs> what went through your mind? Uh, what do I do? What do I do? Just what do I do? And she told us had it been maybe 30 seconds later that she isn't sure if she would have come out of this alive because as you noticed that that red car the car that landed on top of hers landed at the back of her vehicle had it been 30 seconds earlier perhaps it might have landed on the front of her vehicle that mother melissa hughes has since been reunited with her three-month-old daughter she is a first-time mother and she told us that uh, thoughts of her family are what motivated her to get out of that car get out of the way i'll step out of the way here for a second so you can see what's taking place right now the entire scene here is now bathed in floodlights as crews are working to recover the bodies here without risking even more lives. This is going to be a very long process going well into the night. Rescue crews, the only people on the scene here now, in addition to the media and fellow police officers, firefighters. Back to you guys. Okay, All right, Beth, Beth. McDonough, one of the many reporters from Fox 9 uh, on the scene. And we told you earlier that R.T. Ryback was uh, going to be speaking to the media here shortly. Yeah, he's being joined by Governor Pawlenty as well as Police Chief Tete Dolan from Minneapolis Police Department. We want to take Great that day. live to find out what's happening right now. The citizens and staying away from the site because obviously we need to have our resources uh, uh, at full maximum at that point. So what I wanted to do now is uh, turn it over to uh, Chief Dolan to talk a bit more about the incident, to Governor Pawlenty, and then we'll turn to Ted Canova at the Red Cross. Chief? At this point, all survivors that were on the bridge were off the bridge. Uh, we're also, uh, as far as the construction workers are concerned, we've accounted for all the construction workers except for one. We have assistance from Red Cross and numerous other agencies, State Patrol, St. Paul, others. Uh, we have uh, water rescue um, and recovery going on right now. Uh, we have the resources that we need at this time would also say that we, we are clearing out personnel uh, from that area. Perimeter uh, security is our main concern right now, and we're, we are clearing out those areas. You'll see officers checking other bridges. That's just as a precaution. We don't believe at this time that we have anything other than uh, a bridge collapse. I just want to add that uh, uh, right now that uh, uh, we, we did have a school bus full of youth. Those youth have been released to their parents. And uh, we'll have information here about a site for uh, family members that are concerned and where they can go, and we'll give that information a little bit later. Um, that's good. Obviously, this is a catastrophe of historic proportions for Minnesota. And right now we are focused on making sure we do anything and everything to respond to the needs of those individuals who may have been harmed uh, in this incident. And so the mayor described a command and control structure where the Minneapolis Fire Department has the lead in that regard, but they are being assisted by law enforcement and emergency responders from across the metro area, including federal officials, state officials, county officials. That includes law enforcement, includes firefighting, includes uh, paramedics or uh, EMSs, technicians. It includes the sheriff's office. It includes the DNR and various water resources. You saw a... National Guard Black Hawk helicopter on the nearby bridge in case there were medevac needs or other needs that they could help with. So there is a uh, substantial and massive response. I was on site uh, earlier this evening uh, and had a chance to visit and see the site. 
uh, it is obviously a catastrophe. And first and foremost, we want to say to the families who are being impacted by this that our hearts and prayers uh, are with you. But we also want to make sure that you know that we are doing everything we can to make sure that we respond as quickly as we can to the needs of this emergency. And a couple of other just uh, quick items, and we'll turn it over to the Red Cross. Um, first of all, I was on the phone with uh, Secretary Peters uh, from the Federal Transportation Authority. She's going to be here uh, early tomorrow morning. She has pledged all of the federal government's resources and help. We've received uh, gestures from Speaker Pelosi and the congressional delegation that, that they stand by and are willing to help in any way possible. As to the bridge itself, it was built in 1967. It's a somewhat unique uh, structure in the way that it was designed. Uh, it, it was last in, well, it was inspected both in 2005 and 2006. There were no structural deficiencies identified in the bridge. According to MnDOT, there were some cosmetic or minor repair items that needed some attention, but no structural defects or deficits uh, identified in the bridge. They notified us from an engineering standpoint the deck may have to be uh, rehabilitated or replaced in 2020 or beyond, but no immediate or noted structural uh, problems with the bridge. I should also note, however, that there was construction taking place on the bridge relating to concrete repair and rehabilitation and replacement, guardrail replacement, lighting replacement, and work on the joints. That was being done, started recently. It was scheduled to be completed in September of 2007. Uh, we also, of course, will be uh, once this initial response is uh, conducted, we will also be working to deal with traffic issues and rebuilding issues, and we'll address that in more detail. But obviously, there's going to be a very dramatic uh, rerouting of traffic and transit patterns, and uh, we're already working on those plans through the Met Council and others to try to uh, uh, plan for those scenarios. But right now, we're focused on the rescue and recovery efforts, and I think right now we're going to hear from the Red Cross about a request that they have. Thank you, Governor. It's been a very difficult night, as you can imagine. Uh, the Twin Cities Red Cross became the staging area for law enforcement officials, city officials. Um, in the parking lot right now, it was transformed into a parking lot of 80 cars, into a parking lot with uh, five command vehicles and two masts for communications, uh, uh, boats and police officers on horseback, all kinds of scenarios like that. Our hearts go out to all of the victims, everybody who was involved in this, the Red Cross uh, was also the site that the 60 students, 60 kids were taken from the school bus that you saw. Uh, those 60 kids, uh, a few of them had um, some injuries. Uh, two may have been more severe than the other ones, but uh, totally we believe up to 10 kids were transported to area hospitals out of the 60. In the moments that ensued after uh, the kids were taken to the hospital, um, parents and family members were coming to the Red Cross uh, down the hill right on the river road and there were um, emotional um, embraces, as you can imagine. There were tears of joy. There was also a sadness, concern. Happy to say that the Red Cross, the volunteers, the staff there provided comfort. They were there to provide um, emotional counseling and help, along with things like food and, and drink. But uh, it was the emotional shoulder that the Twin Cities Red Cross um, really provided in this time of need, as, as the mayor said, such a dark moment in Minneapolis history. Um, we're getting flooded with requests, as you can imagine, whenever something like this happens and you hear it on the radio and you watch it on TV, flooded with requests from generous people in the Twin Cities, what can we do? And um, it's a difficult time to say this, but I'll put it out there just to honor the requests that are coming. You can visit our website. It's redcrosstc.org. There's information there how you can help uh, from giving blood to donating. Emergencies like this, it's uh, uh, national in scale for uh, a chapter like the Twin Cities Red Cross. We can also use financial donations because this will certainly be uh, breaking some budgets. Um, we just started a budget here. It's a heck of a way to do it, and I hate to talk money at a time of such emergency, but we have a donation hotline, and that number is 612-460-3700. Uh, whatever generosity the Twin Cities community can uh, share, we would certainly appreciate it. Whatever money gets donated, we give it back in space to everybody in our community, so thank you. Well, certainly you have many other questions, but we do ask your support as we uh, not take any at this point. We want to go back to the incident center, make sure all the information uh, we have coming in is correct. We'll return to you as quickly as we can. We know you're doing an extraordinarily important job of getting the information out, but we also ask your indulgence as we go back and uh, gather more information. We'll be coming out as soon as we can on that. We'll be, uh, be speaking with you, uh, obviously, about updates that happen throughout the evening 
on the tragedy as well as for actions people will need for the morning. But with that, we will leave. We will say uh, one other thing that I, I think uh, we can confirm at this point, that the, uh, the family center has been set up at the Holiday Inn Metrodome. Am I correct on that? Okay, at the Holiday Inn Metrodome. Uh, but we'll be we'll be returning uh, uh, with, uh, in approximately an hour or two, and I'm sorry to be vague on that, but it's uh, in the notion of trying to make sure our information is accurate. Uh, we will return to this point. Mayor R.T. Ryback joined by Police Chief Tim Dolan and Governor Tim Pawlenty addressing the situation about this uh, horrific event. In fact, uh, the governor calling it a catastrophic. Uh, event of uh, historic proportions here happening on 35W. The bridge collapsing over the river, the bridge that comes from central Minneapolis and makes its way north toward the University of Minnesota and also to parts of northeast Minneapolis, collapsing completely as many f as 50 cars on the bridge at that time. And we're told that it is now a recovery operation. The mayor confirming at least six fatalities at this point. Before we toss to Jamie Reese, we want to tell people there is an HCMC hotline that you can call if you're trying to find a loved one. That number is 612-873-4000. That's 612-873-4000. There are also staging areas that are going up at the Holiday Inn Metrodome as well. And the Memorial Blood Center is also calling for blood. They need blood uh, as well as the American Red Cross who needs donations. Let's go now to Jamie Reese who is standing by. Jamie was one of the first ones at the scene before any of the emergency vehicles got there. Uh, she saw a lot and we're going to ask her to just to repeat some of the things that she saw today and update us. It really was unbelievable, Robin and Jeff. We were on our way to the Metrodome when we heard about this accident. We raced over to West River Parkway, where it was clear that part of the interstate, we thought then, had collapsed into the river. The other part onto the parkway where bicyclists had been riding on the bike trails. Right here, I want to tell you first, right behind me is the American Red Cross and the Salvation Army, both staging right there. The bridge is just beyond that or at least what's left of it. When we spoke to one man who was on the bridge, he told us it started shaking, then he looked in his rearview mirror, and it was gone. I don't know if you're able to roll some of the video that we took uh, with photojournalist Rob Dupuis right moments after this bridge collapsed. People were running to the scene, trying to help, but many others were just shell-shocked. I spoke to one man who said he was driving in his pickup truck. He free fell about 50 feet, and his truck split in half. He managed to walk away with just a scrape on his nose, but he said he couldn't believe that he even survived. We saw people being pulled from the river, police officers actually having to scale the broken concrete road in order to reach some of those victims. People, we were told it was about 15 to 20 mile per hour, bumper to bumper rush hour traffic at the time, which is why there were so many vehicles we're hearing up to 50 on that bridge. I did speak to several of those children that uh, Governor Valenti and Mayor Ryback were talking uh, about earlier, right after the uh, accident happened, and they were all, as you can imagine, just completely inconsolable that they did appear to be okay. It was just craziness. It was a catastrophic event in the moments after it happened, and uh, there's been a huge response down here, but things are still... I guess, you know, some order being restored as they're beginning to take victims, but now we're starting to get more people come into the area to see what happened, and that's exactly what police are saying that they don't want. Uh, you were down there as a reporter, but emotionally, what you saw is beyond what any people have ever seen. I want you to separate yourself for just a minute and emotionally tell us what you reacted to when you saw the accident down there. Well, you start shaking. Your first impulse is to try to help. I don't have any first aid or paramedics training, so it was impossible. But you feel helpless when you're lying. You see someone lying on the sidewalk covered with blood. It was all we could do to just try to flag down paramedics, make sure they could get to the people who needed the help and stay out of their way as much as possible. We also wanted to know what happened and how could this happen, which is why we were just trying to talk to as many people. And you don't even realize it, but at some point, you're just shaking, you know, talking to someone to get their story about how it felt when they were on that bridge. The next thing you know, you're holding hands. It was just absolutely unreal, absolutely unreal. This is what we saw. You're looking at the video that we saw when we pulled up to the scene. This was one of the first women who was uh, taken to the hospital. That is West River Parkway, where part of the road, and you can see the school bus and the tanker truck behind it had collapsed on it down into the river as well. You can see some of the road collapsed into the river. It, you just, everywhere you looked, there was just one scene or another of disaster. The paramedics were ultimate professionals, 
doing their best to get to every victim as quickly as they could. And you can see how they had to scale that concrete to get down into the river where some of the survivors were treading water and waiting to be rescued. It's amazing that some of these cars weren't more crumpled. We don't know if that man is a he appears to be a rescuer. And uh, weren't sure if he was able to find anyone in that car, but he was holding on to that in the current of the Mississippi River, just trying to stay put as best he could. The response really, police officers got everywhere they had to be immediately, whether it was down on the riverbank, up on the buckled highway, or uh, over on West River Parkway on the bike trail. We're still wanting to make sure that no vehicles were on West River Parkway when the bridge collapsed on top of it. And at this point, there's really just no way to tell. Uh, if you want to hear what uh, one of the people who were on the bridge had to tell us about that, let's take a listen. Well, I was just driving across the bridge and I was coming towards the end and just the whole thing crashed. And I was lucky enough to be by the, the extra school bus and we were right kind of leaned toward the street on the bottom. That's pretty much it. It's like in a horror movie. It was like in a horror movie. That's something we just kept hearing again and again. It was like in a horror movie. It was like an earthquake, but it wasn't anything anybody expected to see for real. Jeff and Robin. Therese live team. on the scene, one of the first reporters to be there, and uh, some of the first cameras and video that you saw from the scene yeah. there. So difficult to see the pain on the faces and the shock and the awe of everybody who uh, went through this this afternoon, and then to be witnesses uh, to it through our television set, sets yeah. uh, to see uh, the catastrophic event happening, as the governor tried to put it here uh, during the news conference just moments ago. It's almost uh, unimaginable. It's unimaginable. Six dead, uh, 22 injuries, uh, six critical injuries. It's not something that we often see. And, and Tom Lydon has been talking to witnesses all evening who have been saying the same things as the witnesses that Jamie Reese talked to. But it's one thing for us to be here in the studio, Tom. You're down there. You see it. You're hearing the reaction. Update us on what people have told more. you. Well, we're in the northwest corner. I can tell you we are inside the perimeter. About uh, two hours ago, there were hundreds of people milling around. And at this point, police have pushed all those people back. Let's go in close, and we'll show you this end of the 35W bridge. And you can see that emergency workers are down there. This is not the, the, the locus of the emergency efforts right now. We are told that they do not believe that there are any uh, victims in this area. Really what they're trying to do right now is, is assess the structural quality. And you might also be able to see a, a train down there as well. The bridge actually collapsed on that train. We are told by police that they do not believe that there are any hazardous chemicals or anything like that at this point. And there you see on the secondary bridge, rescue workers are using that as a little triage section. This is what they call in the parlance of engineering a catastrophic catastrophic structural failure of the bridge. We haven't seen anything like this since the Silver Creek Bridge collapse. That was in the 70s in Pennsylvania. Certainly the last three hours, people here in the Twin Cities will never forget. It was a scene that suspended disbelief. The 35W bridge crossing the Mississippi collapses into the river just after 6 o'clock. Go for it, guys. The scene of barely controlled chaos follows as rescue workers scramble down the cliffs to reach the survivors, some still submerged in their cars. Civilians help rescue dozens of people out of the river. Guy trapped in his car, and I, and I uh, two guys that I was with, like, stripped down to their underwear, jumped in the water basically, and, and ended up cutting them out of his car. Meanwhile, hundreds of people start swarming towards the river. Cell phone service breaks down as thousands yeah, of people we, check we, on their loved ones here, to see so. if they were crossing the 35W bridge. I had trouble with there, you know, all the time I was on it uh, three hours ago, you know, and just uh, coming back and just unbelievable. Just could have been you. Could have been any of us. Back live looking at this end of the bridge and the collapse at this portion. Obviously, the efforts, the recovery efforts will go on throughout the night, and it's really conceivable that it's going to be several days before we even begin to piece together how this structural failure occurred. You know, I should mention that while cell phone signals were down because so many people were on their cell phone trying to reach their loved ones, people coming home from work to see if they were on that bridge, cell phone service just collapsed here for a while. Then it rebooted. Emergency workers, I am told, 
world were not affected by this because of the 800 megahertz system that went into effect several years ago. Very costly system. There was lots of criticism at the time. I am told that that worked superbly. The emergency workers were able to communicate virtually uninterrupted. At the scene afterwards here, it was it was very confusing. Obviously, hundreds of people coming down to, to see this site for themselves. I don't think there was any ill will on anyone's part, but you're watching it on TV, and I think it's basic human nature to want to see it with their own eyes. Police did a very good job of pushing people back. The guardian angels actually came down here, showed up, and they were trying to move people away. They got into it with a few people, people saying, well, who are you? You're not law enforcement. You can't tell me to leave. But Overall, I'd have to say that the Guardian Angels served a valuable purpose in, in assisting police. Quite frankly, there weren't enough police officers. They were busy doing other things and helping with the rescue efforts, and they were able to push people back. And I, and I won't forget the image of some, some fathers, some Catholic priests who came down here. They were on their way, way somewhere else, and they simply came down here because they knew that their spiritual work may be needed. And, and there were lots of people out of the kindness of their heart that thought that they needed to be here to help. Again, to echo what we've heard over and over, and I don't know if it's possible to, to repeat this too often, and that is that at this point, emergency workers need to secure this scene. They've graciously allowed us in here as long as we don't cross any of these yellow tape lines, but they still need to piece this together. They need to recover what bodies may be there uh, for, for the families who need to know as soon as possible where their loved ones are. Obviously, a state of confusion, and, and authorities are asking for people's cooperation, so hopefully people can go along with that. Let's go back to you guys. All right, Tom. All right, Tom understood. Tom, the you. rescue uh, workers and the recovery people need that room to do what they need to do. That's right. And it has just been a difficult day for them from the, the very first moment that this happened, trying to get to the scene, number one, and then being there and dealing with all of the different hurdles that are in the way. So more first-hand uh, hand op observations from, from Tom Light. And we should also say that Senators uh, Coleman and Klobuchar will be heading to the Correct. Twin Cities tomorrow morning with the uh, Secretary of the Transportation Department to survey and assess what happened on the 35W Bridge. You know, police say that they have all the resources that they need right now. They started to clear out an area that had hundreds of people who, Tom Lydon told you, came down to the scene because they couldn't take their eyes away from what they saw on TV or whether they saw it on the street. They had to be down there. Many people helped out. We do know that all the construction workers, 20 to 30 of them that were on the bridge, have been accounted for except for, except for one. one. Mm -hmm. We do have confirmed from... Uh, Mayor R.T. Robeck, who talked to the folks at HCMC, is six dead, six critically injured, 22 injuries that were non-life-threatening. There were uh, roughly 60 kids that were on a school bus. We showed you that video repeatedly this evening. All of those kids are, are out of the hospital. They've been accounted for. Only a few of them had severe injuries, uh, but overall, uh, none of them uh, hurt badly. We're going to go now to Beth McDonough, who's going to update us on uh, some of the folks that she saw down at the accident site. She was, in fact, just a few feet from the accident site. We are still just a few feet. They backed us away just a little bit, but over my right shoulder here, you can see a part of the bridge that is collapsed. And Robin and Jeff, you've been talking about the emergency response here. A firefighter who's been a firefighter for 23 years tells me in his entire career he's never seen any sort of response like this. There was a statewide call for help. Every single police department, fire department, paramedic, they had crews here on the scene, and that has really helped out and helped to get some control of the situation here. Behind me, this area, which is just filled now with emergency personnel, an hour ago was filled with survivors, 20 to 30 survivors that congregated there. They were sitting up on the uh, fence post over there trying to get their wits. They were also being treated by paramedics on the scene. Uh, some of those survivors made it off that bridge that you see there. They were in those cars that are crumpled up, piled on top of each other. Some of the drivers helping each other out of this very chaotic situation to safety. They walked to safety together and many of them telling us that they weren't sure that they would get out of this alive once the other cars started piling up on top of them. And uh, rescue crews, uh, basically use this area as a staging area for quite a while. You're right there, you're seeing the fourth section of the bridge, and uh, there's a reason why you aren't seeing a lot of people around that bridge, because about an hour or so ago, uh, emergency crews evacuated everyone except for them, and they've kindly allowed the media to still be here to cover this event so we can bring it to you here at home. We are at a safe distance, we should point out, but they weren't taking any chances. They were pretty concerned that that fourth part of the bridge could possibly collapse as well. So they pulled everyone back. Right there, you see one of the survivors. Her name is Melissa Hughes. That is her red car. She was in it driving home from work. 
stuck in traffic because traffic wasn't moving on the bridge at all when all of a sudden she said she started to see things blow up in the air out over on the side. She said she even saw one construction worker go airborne. That's when she knew something was seriously wrong. Let's hear her very compelling story in her own words. Um, I was the red car, so I'm very lucky. Um, I don't really know. All of a sudden it was kind of this free fall feeling and seeing things in the air and just, just, yeah. <laughs> Did you see the bridge collapsing before your eyes? Um, just more so things in the air that shouldn't be in the air. Like what? Just cars and things, people in the air that like shouldn't be. Just the, toss something up, up in the, the air. air. Yeah. Cars landed on top of yours. Yes. Yes. Oh. With, with your baby? No, no. My husband brought my baby so I could feed her. Oh, okay. So you have to have that part. <laughs> what went through your mind? Uh, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Were you scared for your life? No, I don't think I was scared for my life. I just was not what to do. Yeah, I didn't know what to do. Sorry, sorry, sorry. About six o'clock this happened? I don't even know. Yeah. I don't even know. Are you injured? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think you feel like you're okay? I feel like I'm pretty fine, yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, my neck's starting to get sore the longer we sit here, but I don't know if that is anything or not. Did strangers try to help you out? Yes. Tell me yes. about that. Um, I was sitting in my car, more so just not sure what we're supposed to do, and there was a gentleman who was injured, who had, was outside of a vehicle, not when it happened, but he had gotten out of the vehicle, and he was screaming in pain, and I was kind of watching him, and then this gentleman came up running to my door, are you okay, are you okay, can you get out? And so he got me out and then walked me down um, here where it was safe. What did you say to him? I, he was gone. <laughs> oh, yeah. He was gone. I think he was an employee here. I don't know. He was gone very quickly. When you look at your car now, it was through mine. Luck. Luck. I was so lucky that that vehicle landed where it did and not further up on my car. Luck. And knowing what's on the other side of that bridge. And Again, that is Melissa Hughes telling us her survival story like one of so many out here because on the bridge it's a little dark now for you to see but there's still about half a dozen cars on that bridge which means half a dozen other people who also have survival stories to tell and she was certainly happy to tell it she has since been reunited with her three-month-old daughter out here on the scene now basically it looks like a police parking lot and a fire department parking lot. Everyone, uh, the officials taking over the scene here as they uh, try to gain control here and start to begin their investigation, try and make sure that no one else is stuck inside those cars, make sure that they can uh, clear the scene and, of course, keep people at bay from that fourth section of the bridge so another part of it possibly doesn't break down as well but that's the very latest from here back to you guys hey Thank Beth, you. Beth we're hearing more. yeah and we've been told now as we look uh, at sky fox 9 above the scene the sky's getting dark but we've been told that uh, at least one portion of the bridge, the north portion, I believe, is showing some downward movement toward the river. So they're trying Still to make unstable. sure that they get everybody clear of that now because the possibility of that collapsing as well exists. And they don't want to make this any worse than it already is, uh, unimaginable that it could be. Uh, you're talking about 140,000 cars a day crossing the 35W bridge from downtown Minneapolis to parts north and vice versa. Uh, you're talking about 50 cars that were reported in the water, as many as six fatalities at least at this point, according to Mayor R.T. Ryback. Everyone who was on the center portion of the bridge when it fell and survived is no longer on that portion of the bridge. So the rescue people got in there and did their job. And now it's up to the recovery teams to work in some very difficult conditions downstream from the lock and dam there where the current can be plenty swift. Oh, we told you that Secretary Peters from the Federal Transportation Board is going to be here tomorrow with Senators Coltman and Klobuchar who are coming back into town <laughs> to assess the damage. But a person who knows about this firsthand is Lynn Levine. He is a former Transportation Commissioner under Governor Rudy Purpich. He has seen similar accidents like this back in the 80s. I think that you talked about the Lake Street Bridge accident that happened back in the 80s while you were a Transportation Commissioner. Well, the two accidents are... <clears throat> they're not exactly the same. No. We had a bridge, uh, Lake Street Marshall Avenue bridge, that collapsed under construction. The ironwork uh, fell in, and at one time there were 21 people on the bridge working and on the structure, and one, one got everybody off and one went up, and the whole thing imploded and fell into the river. But what happened afterwards is what's going to happen here. 
there'll be a lot of uh, second guessing and what went wrong and what could have been done to prevent it. What it, what we, what it really happened, what, what this points out is that the, it's a nationwide problem. I mean, I agree with Governor Pawlenty. It's a catastrophe of major proportions. It's mm -hmm. heartbreaking. And I, just a few hours ago, was in Washington, D.C. in the office of Congressman Oberstar. And it's a coincidence, I guess, uh, we were talking about the crumbling infrastructure in the United States. I left there, went to the airport, and when I landed, my wife told me what had, what had happened, and I saw all the people gathered around the TVs Give there. us the numbers on the bridges around the country and then within the, the state and the metro area that you say could it's, all be it's 40, 40 to 50 percent of the bridges need work? Well, the, uh, in, in Minnesota, we have close to 20,000 bridges statewide. Uh, so it isn't only an interstate bridge that we need to look at. But this will, in, this will accelerate the inspection at township bridges and city bridges, and inspectors will have to get involved uh, in, in a massive program to look it over. Now, they do a lot of that on a regular basis. How much is being done and how fast they can do it is another question. Nationwide, it's really a nationwide problem. We have uh, almost uh, close to 600,000 bridges uh, nationwide. Uh, surveys uh, show that between 40 and 50 percent of the bridges are deficient doesn't mean that they're structurally deficient, that they're going to cave in. They have some degree of deficiency. And that's been a number that, that we had when, when we were there. But it it's becomes a funding issue. How can you rebuild America's infrastructure? It's just what we talked about in Washington today. It, it needs a, This great country is falling further and further behind. The, I mean, this bridge collapse is an example, but that happens around the country on a regular basis. The, it's, it's America's problem. Uh, we have increasing traffic. You know what it's like in the Twin Cities today. Yeah.